Um, within the bill, there is a provision that protects long-term veterans with, that are in long-term care facilities. Would that, is that correct? Senator McElhenney? Any bedrooms? Yes. Senator Williams? And why were we moved to exempt them from the requirements that others would be required to? The, the thought process there is uh, a, a, an earlier uh, uh, discussion about the use of a Medicaid card uh, was something we did not find desirable. It didn't have a, a, a photo uh, on it or, and it had other information we did not want to have out there. But we wanted to provide some way for a care facility, uh, if you're living there, to also be eligible to provide an ID to individuals that may not have uh, the ability, as, as we discussed earlier, to get to a, uh, a photo ID center, a, a PennDOT, an official photo ID center. So any licensed care facility in Pennsylvania is eligible to issue a photo ID to their residents, and it would be an acceptable form of ID for the purposes of voting. I understand this to be to veterans, not to everyone. Veterans, no. It's for any anybody in a, a care facility. So if you choose to care for your loved one at home as opposed to a facility, is there protection for them? That would not happen. They would have to uh, get a regular ID. This would only be for a licensed care facility would be able to authorize and act as if it was a state agency in that respect. By doing such, does, does the maker of this or the, um, the person representing this piece of legislation recognize they're creating a class by doing such? Uh, no, we did not exactly exempt the individual. What we did is we pr further provided, as we expanded for college IDs and municipalities, we pr further provided for an additional uh, licensed uh, facility to provide uh, an acceptable form of ID. It exempts this, these individuals from the requirements that other individuals will be required to follow. Uh, I would respectfully disagree. I think they have to follow the same uh, uh, requirements. You're just providing for an additional uh, agency, so to speak, that's licensed by the state of Pennsylvania to provide a photo ID. But it's different than the rest of the people who are under this law, or under this I, under, under the potential. Respectfully, I would disagree that it's it's not a separate class. Then why was it written at all? In an, in an attempt to expand the numbers of IDs available, that was one consideration that was given, and we decided to allow them to issue an acceptable form of ID, just as we allowed for the colleges, we allowed for military IDs, we allowed for other forms other than a PennDOT ID. That was a, an ID that we found to be acceptable. Students um, that are, in, and you mentioned this in your comment, students that are in Pennsylvania uh, are treated differently than students from Pennsylvania that are colleges outside of Pennsylvania. Is that correct? It would have to be a Pennsylvania university that would allow for it, yes. Even though the student is from Pennsylvania and registered in Pennsylvania, is that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't quite hear you. Even though the student may be from Pennsylvania and is registered in Pennsylvania, is that correct? Yeah, we, Mr. President, what we were attempting to do was allow for the agents, an expansion of the list of the agencies and not focus on the individual themselves. So we, that we can control, or we have some say in a state institution that's accredited in Pennsylvania is allowed to issue an ID. And a state uh, nursing care facility or home care facility that's licensed in Pennsylvania is allowed to issue an ID. PennDOT is one of the licensed uh, agencies that are allowed to issue the, an acceptable form of ID. And we did not focus on the actual individual, but who was allowed to be, uh, uh, make and give out the uh, appropriate forms of identification. I'm just trying to establish that a student from Pennsylvania who lives in Pennsylvania, who goes to school in Pennsylvania, is treated differently than a student who comes from Pennsylvania but goes to a different state. That's all I'm trying to establish. No, I would respectfully disagree with that premise. That they're not treated a premise. That's not. I mean, these things. Some of these things. We're, we're, I'm not even trying to define and have a debate. I'm just establishing a set of facts. Now you're saying the words don't mean what they mean. I'm saying that if a student who goes, who's from Pennsylvania, goes to a college outside of Pennsylvania is not allowed to use their ID from Harvard, but you're allowed to use it from Penn State, they're treated differently. You're saying they're not. I would say that the list of, of IDs that are uh, contained in the bill, on the underlying bill, uh, are listed there. And any student uh, that can go and get an a ID or any other individual in Pennsylvania get an ID from one of those approved sources is allowed to get that ID and use it for the purposes of voting. I'm not sure what that meant. But if you go to Franklin and Marshall, are you able to use your college ID? If it's an approved Pennsylvania accredited institution, yes. No, it's a private, well, yeah, it's approved. 
So it's a private institution in Pennsylvania. It's a private college in Pennsylvania. Then you could use that ID if it's accredited in Pennsylvania. That, right. If Harvard gets accredited in Pennsylvania, we'll accept their ID as well. Okay. Um, and, I mean, I'm asking these for, well, let's just talk to these two particular areas. But the gentleman yield just for a moment. Under Senate rules, uh, actually, the conversation is to go through the chair. So if occasionally, if occasionally the two of you might throw in a Mr. President every once in a while. I apologize, Mr. President. <laughs> the gentleman may proceed. Mr. President, I don't understand why you're coming up with these dumb ideas. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so, Mr. President, um, in an effort to prevent fraud and reduce fraud, a student who comes from Indiana, previously registered in Indiana, comes to the University of Pennsylvania, registers at University of Pennsylvania, uh, automatic, and registers for a driver license, automatically gets signed up to be a voter in Pennsylvania, automatically, because that's what we do, um, is now protected under this process. Is that accurate? Is now what under the process? Now is now a registered voter in Pennsylvania. Yes. All right. So now we have a person who's not from Pennsylvania, but simply because they chose to go to school in Pennsylvania, they have a driver's license in Pennsylvania, even though they still have a registration in another state and may vote in two states. By accident, because I'm 18, I'm not, I mean, I'm 21, I'm not thinking about this. We're actually doing something to improve the quality and protection under fraud or fraud. Is that accurate? I, I, I guess that's a circumstance that could happen, but all the circumstances is not 100 percent foolproof positive. But I would say that they would use their driver's license as the ID to, to uh, go down and vote. If they registered at that school and they exercised their right there, uh, under law, current law and, and this law, they would still be able to do that. Glad you mentioned foolproof, foolproof positive, Mr. President. I'm glad we mentioned that. Um, provisional ballots. Um, and I'll draw your attention to the fact that Wisconsin just, um, in Wisconsin, uh, they just struck down their voter ID uh, law for some of the items that we're talking about today. Provisional ballots, no proof will be made public. Can you explain? how that is to work. The process, I don't know what happened in Wisconsin, but the process under this bill would be that when you apply for an absentee ballot, you need to fill out the last four numbers of your Social Security number or your driver's license number. And the Board of Registration, when they enter that to send you out your ballot, would, would prior to sending you out the ballot, will have an uh, electronic check with the SURE system to verify that your name indeed matches either the driver's number or the last four of your Social Security number. And there's a language that says there's no proof that will be made public, which means that a select group of people can determine without proving why that you no longer have the right to vote. Well, that was a, uh, a, a security measure, I guess, a, a, a uh, uh, identity theft measure. You do not necessarily want to have a public document with your driver's license number or your last four of your social security number to be made positive. Uh, it is a, a check that is done within the Board of Registration to verify that the name matches uh, is indeed the same individual that's requesting about is the registered voter. Unfortunately, that protection now may fly in the face of an individual who in fact may be the person that they are. Someone may be able to deny them the right to vote and they don't have to verify why, they're ver why they are denying their right to vote. Is that a potential consequence, Mr. President? I do not believe that would be the consequence. I think that if they're denied, they're uh, sent back the denial, and, and maybe there was a typo, maybe there was a, uh, uh, they couldn't understand the handwriting on there, and it would be verified. You can go in there and, and say, here I am, verify me, uh, and, and get the absentee ballot, but th it is a check that we're putting in to ensure the, the integrity of the system. If you physically can go in there, you're absolutely right, you can go in there, but if you can't go in there, then you are limited to your ability to, to verify who you are. And the, it, my point is, the entity that is doing the verifying doesn't have to make public those reasons. In other words, they don't have to use the detailed information that you're providing. So maybe I'm missing something, but this is actual language from the bill. Can you tell no me what section you're referring public. to? What section are you referring to? I, I, I don't have the section recorded, but I can get it to you. In a but we'll move on from there. Um, What source is cited for the necessity 
that relates to the level of fraud in Pennsylvania. What source is cited for what the source, necessity? What sort, of, what source of information are we using? I mean, I understand this bill to be moving, Mr. President, based upon that we're concerned about voter fraud in Pennsylvania. So I'm simply asking the question, where are we getting information that there is rampant, modest, minor, or negligible voter fraud? If, if uh, the gentleman is supposing uh, that that was the uh, uh, impetus for the bill, I would suggest you talk to the prime sponsor, which was Representative Metcalf. Um, for my part in the bill, I would say that ensuring the integrity uh, of the uh, voting system is p in Pennsylvania is just as important as any potential fraud uh, that might be out there. If, if it's something that we — steps that we can take to ensure that the public feels safe and secure with our voting system and it does not cause undue hardships upon the voting public, which I do not believe this bill does, then it's something we should support and move forward with. The original thought behind the, pro behind the bill um, I would suggest you refer uh, — you, you, I would suggest you ask uh, Representative Metcalf as to what started out the entire process. Well, all I can suggest is we're taking up the bill from Representative Metcalf. The governor has spoken about voter fraud. Representative, vote, Representative Metcalf has spoken about voter fraud. And members of this actual Senate body have spoken about voter fraud. And in fact, when it was brought before our committee, our respective committees, Mr. President, uh, the State Government Committee, the impetus behind that was voter fraud. I don't, I'm not quite sure how that would miss the gentleman, but it has been stated several times that the impetus behind this is voter fraud. Now, maybe you're immune to that, but I'd be shocked if you were. So I'm asking a question. The person who's chairing the committee from which the bill arrived took it through, managed the process, I'm sure is familiar with the term voter fraud and its association. So I'm asking again. But I do not know the genesis of what that that voter fraud was taking. You'd have to take it up with Representative So Mike to your Hill. knowledge, there's no, Mr. President, to your knowledge, there's no uh, data um, or official objective study that relates to any specific voter fraud patterns in Pennsylvania. Would that be accurate? I have no knowledge one way or the other of that. Um, I just simply, as you said, the bill landed in my committee. I'm the chairman of the committee, and I moved the process along. The cost associated with this, is there a fiscal note for this, Mr. Mr. President? You have to ask the appropriations chairman. Is there a knowledge of a, of a fiscal note? Well, can we find out if there's a fiscal note? That one? Yes, I believe they're providing that as we speak. Do we know what that number might be? I am not a, I'm, for the record, Mr. Uh, President, I'm not a member of the Appropriations Committee and was not involved in drafting the fiscal note to the bill. Um, so does the gentleman happen to know the cost associated with this particular uh, piece of legislation? I think we need to wait for the fiscal note. Okay. But would the gentleman be aware of the independent financial office? I'm sure we're aware of that, correct? Is that correct? That, that nod is Am I aware of the office? Yes. Yes, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and to your knowledge, did we require or ask for um, a cost estimate from that office regarding this piece of legislation? I do not know the answer to that, Mr. President. I, that, I know I did not. Okay. Is that item that's in your hand currently? Um, I have the fiscal note. I would ask that they provide Senator Williams with a copy of the fiscal note. Well, just, I, I, Mr. President, I, I can, I trust that what you read would be accurate. So what does it say? Well, since you asked, I'll start reading it. <laughs> House Bill 934 amends the election code to require each voter to present proof of identification when he or she appears to vote at any election. Proof of identification is as defined. In the case of an elector who has religious objection to being photographed, a valid without photo driver's license or identification ID card issued by PennDOT. Case two, in the case of all other electors who vote in person, a document that satisfies all the following. A, shows the name of the individual and the name of substantially conforms to the name of the person as it appears in the district register. B, shows a photograph of the individual. C, includes an expiration date which has not expired except in the case of an ID card issued by PennDOT which allows a 12-month grace period 
for expired licenses or military ID cards, which show an indefinite expiration date. Three, the document must be issued by the one of the following. A, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. B, the federal government. C, a Pennsylvania public or private institution of higher learning. Or D, a Pennsylvania care facility. In the case of a qualified absentee elector who is applying for an absentee ballot, A, for an elector who has been issued a valid driver's license, the elector's driver's license number. Mr. President, Mr. President, for the benefit of time, there's a section of the fiscal note that talks about the fiscal impact. And I'm sure I'll provide it for you, and, and I don't believe it's up to me to read it and interpret the fiscal note. Well, there's I'll, a question that relates to I'll read it to, to you, and no, no, you don't have to read the fiscal note. I'm asking about the fiscal impact. So there's a there's a section there that talks about the cost, or should be. And I'll be happy to provide it to you, and you can read it. Okay, that's not the fiscal impact portion you're reading. This is the fiscal note, Mr. Right. Mr. President. Right. And I, and so there's a section there that specifically speaks to the fiscal impact. So that's all we need for the benefit of the record. Is there, is that attached to the information that the gentleman? May I have? believe I was getting to that, but yeah. I can give it to you, and you can determine what it says. According to this fiscal note, it says a million dollars in FY12, and then it says $3.87 million in FY12. So that's a cumulative amount of $4 million and $4,837,500. Is that correct? If that's what the fiscal note states, and I think we discussed earlier about the $4 million number. Right. Well, it's actually almost $5 million. I believe that the gentleman is a member of the Appropriations Committee. I'm sorry, no. No? Well, neither am I, so neither one of us were there for the uh, deliberations of the cost. No. So the cost to the Commonwealth is almost $5 million. Um, and just for the benefit of the public uh, and for the gentleman who is explaining the legislation and for all those who claim to be fiscally responsible and concerned members of the legislature, I do believe we are running a deficit this year. And from what I'm told, we are cutting services across the Commonwealth. Where does the gentleman propose that we will get this $4 million, or almost $5 million? That would be part of the budgetary process that and we will we undertake in the coming months. So in other words, we will cut education, potentially? Well, I think that's a discussion for another day. I think we're on the topic of this law uh, and the impacts upon the Commonwealth. And if there's a $5 million fiscal note, then at some point, the governor and the, the legislature will come together to provide for it in the budget. I've been here for a little while, and every time that cost comes up in the form of a bill, we've talked about it then. Uh, it's never been delayed for another day. And matter of fact, that's the first time I've ever heard it from your side of the aisle that we'll talk about the cost associated with the bill in a deficit year, um, and we'll delay it for another day. But I'll take that as a comment uh, and reflect it uh, in our deliberations as we approach the budget. But this will further drive us into a deficit. Would the gentleman agree to that, Mr. President? Uh, I think that the budget process, like any other bill we pass, has fiscal consequences. Uh, and we will determine where it will fill, find its spot in the budget when we do the budget in this coming months. I'm asking a direct question, Mr. President. This $5 million, which to my knowledge, there's not a revenue source attached to it, um, unless I'm missing something. Um, and since it's coming out of that committee, it came out of that committee, I'm sure we did a lot of study on it. I'm asking a very direct question, Mr. President. Will this $5 million be added to the current deficit? The $5 million will be added to the current budget. Which is in deficit. The $5 million will be added to the current budget. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I would request formally that the independent financial office um, if it's okay with the gentleman, that he request from that independent financial office the cost associated with this particular bill. I believe you could make that request as well, Mr. President. I can, but I'm, we're not offering the bill. I'm, I'm offering the bill right now. You're asking me to suspend the offering of the bill to make the request? Absolutely not. I'm suggesting that in addition to 
what has already occurred, that a request be forwarded to that office that outlines the costs associated with this bill. Respectfully, I would request that the senator make that request himself. I mean, I, I am fine with doing it, as I said. Since it's not my piece of legislation and I'm not for it, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. And I'm asking the, those who are supporting it and moving it forward that they might want to make that request. But, and since they made great arguments to have this independent um, office, which also costs us more money, they might want to use it. But if you're saying you don't want to use it, you don't want to make the request, that's fine, just for the record. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying at this point I relied upon the, the Appropriations Committee fiscal note to set the, the costs involved in it, and I moved the bill uh, accordingly. And if the gentleman would like to utilize that office for more information to, to make sure that the Appropriations Committee came up with the exact number, then that is with, well within his rights to do. Thank you, Mr. President. That ends my period of interrogation. I'd like to conclude with comments. Gentlemen, is in order, you may proceed. I think certainly the period of interrogation further illuminates the concerns that all of us, and frankly many Pennsylvanians, and frankly the majority of Pennsylvanians, would have when the intent is to do good, but there's not a purpose. In other words, there is an argument in search of a certain level of facts. When I asked the question about voter fraud, there was no support of any document, data, or even speculation that relates to voter fraud. In fact, we were turned to the level of integrity that supports the voting process, which I respect, and I'm sure we all want to protect that process. But the truth is, if you destroy the process in search of integrity, I'm not sure we find a lot of character in that argument. I heard about nothing is foolproof, positive. I'm quite clear on that comment holds the armament of argument today because there's nothing that we're positive about in terms of moving this bill. The most clarion comment I heard, though, was no voter will be turned away. No voter will be turned away, which would imply every voter's franchise would be exercised in that process, which would make everybody feel very comfortable and at ease. As it was implied, this is a pragmatic, simple suggestion. No voter will be turned away. But not every vote will be counted, Mr. President. And I think that all of Pennsylvania should be aware of that. After a panel that may review your provisional ballot that is no longer required to provide public information about how they arrive at the decision, your vote may not count. And if you can't afford to pay for a birth certificate, then an implied and indirect poll tax may be a part of this process. And in fact, we found in parts of, of Wisconsin where actual state government workers were selective in their, their desire to say who had the right to vote, who had a right to actually get certified, who actually had a right to get the identity associated, the requested identification card, they were discriminating in that, act, in that execution. Why this rises to the level of passion for many of us, and I'm at my best behavior today to be self-contained, understand the nature of this country. For all those who will wrap themselves in the flag and describe themselves as removing ourselves from government and cutting the size of government and requiring that government no, no longer intrudes in our lives, then I call you a hypocrite today if you vote for this bill. If you want to stand on this floor, rail about how government intrudes in your life, wrap yourself in the flag, then I refer yourself to what everybody keeps talking about is the Constitution. This is not like getting a driver's license, which is a privilege. This is not like applying for a job, which is an offer. This is not even like going to a hospital and getting health care. This is what defines America as compared to other nations across the world, a true democracy. And what we find ourselves in this next generation, they don't give a hoot enough to participate. But we, we engage in a charade to suggest that we are protecting the integrity of the voting process. And now 
those who want to participate and have sacrificed their lives to participate, and I specifically talk about people of color and women who have died in this country, fought this country, and arrived at a point in time in society when they have a right to vote, we are now telling them, go through another hoop. I come from a proud lineage of parents and great-great-great-grandparents who knew what this implied sly method of removal meant. It meant that they no longer counted as full Americans. And understand, I don't stand on this floor railing normally about issues of discrimination. Whatever the playing field is, I'll take it. If somebody sees that I'm not necessarily felt a build and they hold it against me, I'll still take that on. If somebody recognizes that my hair is now gray, no longer black, and decides that they don't particularly care for me, I'll take that on. If my faith doesn't comport with theirs, I don't care, I'm an American, I'll take that on. And certainly, if my ethnicity, my neighborhood, my background, I'll take all that on. Because understand, I am a confirmed American. And no card, no state identification, nobody can take that from me. But it's defined around certain basic principles. And one of those is the franchise and the right to vote, making all of us equal in the eyes of the government and, as it says, in the eyes of our Lord. We all should count. And none of us should be cared or scared of how we are counted. This moment represents a changing paradigm, not just in Pennsylvania, but in this nation. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, in a presidential year where people will accuse each other of political motivations, we've now taken politics to a new level. We've integrated it into the conversation of what defines this nation. There are far too many question marks with this particular piece of legislation. There are far too many facts which would make any logical person be concerned are if they truly believe they're doing good, are we doing the best and good as we possibly can do? In the pursuit of perfection, are we throwing out a whole category of people? I don't certainly try to plead to anyone's heart today because those decisions are already made. But I would make you reflect upon your common sense. Anyone who would suggest that this is, not, this is about integrity and not about one's right to vote, I would suggest common sense doesn't resound there. Anyone who will come to a mic and say nothing is foolproof, then guess what? Then we should move on, unless it is in fact foolproof, because it is about this country and your citizenship. Anyone who would come to a mic and say, you know what, I don't know how much it costs, and a commonwealth is in debt, but we'll figure that out later, and also be at the same time looking at a budget where we cut public education, we cut prisons, we cut safety, we go down the line of cuts and add to a further debt, then I would suggest that that alone would be enough. But add on to that, another state, Wisconsin, which did almost exactly the same thing, has found discrimination applied in its selection in the state should draw cause, but ultimately, anyone, as I mentioned earlier on, anyone who calls themselves a true American, a patriot, if you will, who's concerned about all Americans, and that's what America's supposed to be about, all Americans, then I would suggest that you should not be voting for this bill. And if they truly do want to have a plan to prevent voters from being fraudulently disenfranchised, I think all of us could support that. If we could find us any set of facts, matter of fact, a kernel of fact or credibility that would suggest Here's a pattern of fraudulent behavior. I think all of us would sign up immediately to remove that from the process of voting. But that's not what we find ourselves today to do. It's more about political bidding, nodding, and genuflecting to the short term. And I will tell you, I will be long gone from this chamber when the consequence of such a law is implemented in Pennsylvania. Our greatest days will be behind us, and unfortunately, a population that's not interested, doesn't desire to exercise its franchise, 
will be left with the humble submission of a law that now allows them to exit themselves from voting. That is not what America is about. That's not what Pennsylvania is supposed to be about. And that's certainly not what this General Assembly should be about in these tough, tough times. We should be talking about jobs, job creations, and alleviation of pain. Instead, we continue to pile on with these ideas that come from an ideology that's far removed from the majority of members that I know in the Senate. And I don't care whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. Most of us are fair-minded. This is a bill which is crammed down the majority of members of this throat. It's required for you to do it because you are signed up in a process that's driving and dragging you along. I feel sorry for those who are required to do such. But most importantly, I'm afraid of what's going to be in front of us. And I'm afraid of the consequence of this law hitting the books. Thank you, Mr. President.